Alameda. Roger, hi. Welcome to KGO. You're on with Arnie Gunderson. Go ahead. Hi, Pat. I do have a question for Arnie, and uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that it seems like we're in the grips of some sort of economic and political insanity that continues to promote the nuclear industry as it is now structured. And sure, some people will make a lot of money, but is it worth damaging the Earth's environment to the extent that we can? And my question for him is as follows. My belief is that nuclear power generation at this point should be restricted to laboratories where people do research on it. Uh, I wonder what his opinion is. Should we be shutting all nuclear power plants down at this point? Should we be keeping just the existing and not building new ones? Or um, should we be looking to build new plants when the technology is safe? Uh, those are excellent questions, Arnie. Um, yeah, they, they really are. Um, you know, I guess on my journey through through life here, I started out as you know a nuclear engineer and and thought that the math is very compelling and I could get excited about it and thought I was going to save the world. Um, then I became a whistleblower in 1990 and realized that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wasn't doing its job, but I still believed in the technology. And then Fukushima came, and and it convinced me that we are not smart enough for this technology as a as a race people are just not smart enough mother nature will figure out something that can destroy one of these so you know I, but but yet we can't shut them all down tomorrow i have gone on record with the nuclear regulatory commission there's 23 plants in the us that are just like fukushima and uh, those should be shut down. But uh, as far as the other 80, I don't think we should relicense them, but I, I, I don't think as a nation we can just unilaterally shut them down tomorrow. You know, it's a technology that can destroy a country. Um, Nikolai Gorbachev in his um, memoir said that it wasn't perestroika that destroyed the Soviet Union, it was Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we're watching it pan out over in, in Japan as well. And, you know, it's, you can have 40 years of good days and one bad day and you're toast. And, and I, I don't think we really comprehend that this is a technology that can destroy a country. Yeah, and taking risks like that. Now, I have heard people speak of... Uh, with great hope about using thorium as a fuel, and they say that many of the problems um, from the kind from using um, what is I don't I see I don't know the difference between these fuel types, but what what we're currently using, which I guess is uranium, right? Yes. Okay, so the difference between thorium and uranium that if you were using thorium instead of uranium, you wouldn't have the problems that were resulted in uh, Fukushima. Is that true? Well, you'd have different problems and probably lesser problems, but, you know, it gets back to money. Uh, all of these concepts are so expensive in comparison to conservation or solar or wind that the crossover occurred this year, that, you know, new solar and new wind are cheaper than new nuclear. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I guess my point is why do we want to invest in a technology that has the potential to you know, destroy a country when you can use you know, smart grids. And I think, you know, the, the what's happened over the, in the 20th century, we needed big power plants. But now with smart grids and computers, we can put little power plants all over the place yeah. and they can communicate with the computer. Yeah, that's what my friend Harvey Wasserman has been saying for a while. Oh, there you go. Okay. Right. And, and, you know, so you can, we don't, the, the old paradigm, it's almost like the national line. And, you know, we, we built this thing in France to fight World War I, but the technology changed and World War II just did an end run around it. And it, that these central station plants are huge investments in a national line f fighting a 20th century. war when in fact in the 21st century we have a we can we can have a different paradigm if we choose to all right well let me be selfish um what's happening in japan right now and we know there was the ghost ship that was found in in all of this um i read recently about something that apparently happened a year ago that hillary clinton signed some deal with japan that we weren't going to be 
testing products that came to the United States. Uh, you know, we're in California. We're we're like in the in the line. You know, you cross the ocean. There we are. Um, can we eat the fish? Can we eat the seaweed in in that uh, our uh, sushi is made from that comes from Japan? Is this safe for us? Are we going to be impacted? And why um, did Hillary sign that? Isn't that kind of scary? It didn't. Is is it true? I think your wife told me this that after she signed that, it was like within a month. The EPA said they were no longer testing. Right. Um, I call it don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't ask, she, don't tell, die. <laughs> yeah, she won't She won't ask the Japanese what's in it, and they won't tell us what's in it, and everybody will be happy. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I was an expert witness on a case out here in, in at Indian Point, and um, the people that own that reactor, uh, I found some documents in, in the legal process, and one of them was a, uh, a note from the executive saying that Hillary Clinton had been at their plant, and they had a minor leak, nothing like a Fukushima minor leak, and she was threatening congressional hearings because her house is only 10 miles away. Mm. So, you know, I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah. And we really need it. Um, uh, we need monitoring of the food. And it's all been about money, though. It's really been protecting the Japanese economy and protecting Tokyo Electric. Um, and the, the, the decisions we're making to not monitor food are really because of the fear of losing money. Uh, I think we should be monitoring food. If the, if the feds won't do it, then universities should. Um, you know, that you had a scare recently where somebody came up with a study about iodine in um, seaweed. That's, that, that study was done right after Fukushima, and, of course, iodine only has an eight-day half-life. So there's no more iodine in the seaweed. Um, but, you know, we're getting studies out of the, the Cascades all the way down into Southern California where we're seeing, you know, cesium in pine needles and, uh, you know, cesium in the ground uh, up in Oregon and, and uh, up in Vancouver. Not a lot, but uh, I guess what my biggest concern is that this stuff, called, it's called bioaccumulation. It yes. works its way up the food chain. Yeah. And sooner or later, we're going to wind up seeing it in salmon and tuna and barracuda, you know, the top of the food chain animals. And we're not testing. And, um, and that, it frightens me that we're not testing. Maybe we should be starting to eat that uh, the, that farm salmon because we always go for the wild salmon. Oh, Maybe there's a we need a change. That's another problem. I, go for, <laughs> I, I love salmon, and I'm eating as much of it as I can this year because I'm not sure what 2013 will bring. That's so scary. Okay, let's. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. Let's talk with Nathan. Nathan's calling from Oakland. Hi, Nathan. Welcome to KGO. You're on with Arnie Gunderson. Hi there. Thank you so much, Kat, and uh, thank you, Arnie, for all the work that you've done over the last 13 months and keeping us informed and uh, kind of putting this very complex issue into um, terms that are di- digestible for us laypersons. And I just wanted to say that given the dire and really apocalyptic warnings from um, Mr. Matsumura as well as uh, Ambassador um, uh, Mitsuhei at the recent conference in South Korea, uh, it's it's clear that this issue is is no longer and really haven't been for some time is really no longer a Japanese issue and is uh, the purview of the global community given that it, it threatens essentially the entirety of life on this planet and that such uh, as such the inter- international community should be addressing it and uh, uh, that's even something that I know that M- Ambassador uh, Mitsuhei had called for was the creation of a of an international um, scientific team to address vent fuel pool number four and so. I just wanted to share with you and with the listeners that I've taken the initiative of creating a petition on the WhiteHouse.gov site that calls for just that. It asks President Obama to create the Fukushima International Scientific Advisory Team, and if it receives 25,000 signatures by the 8th of May, then it warrants a, a response, an official response from the administration. Good. And okay, how, how do so we do it? How do we get to it to sign very, it? Very easily. It's a, the, the, the URL is very simple. It's wh.gov forward slash capital Q, capital U, lowercase i. Alternatively, if you go to the White House site and you navigate into the petitions area, it's now reached the threshold for being publicly searchable on the White House site. So Good. if you're in Fukushima, you can check that out. So you know, I appreciate that very much. I will go there and I will sign it. Maybe we can put that on our website as well to help 